everyone, and um, thank you so much for being here. I sincerely mean that. Um, it's really difficult to ask somebody to take a week out of their lives and give up everything they do to learn a new paradigm or to upgrade a paradigm. So I know what it takes, and I thank you very much for being here. You're the warriors out there uh, carrying the message out to the world, and God knows we need as many of us as we can get to carry this message out. So it was Dr. Bernard Jensen, one of the founders of naturopathy, naturopathic medicine, that said, death begins in the colon. We know that Hippocrates said something very similar, and uh, the practical application of this is, when in doubt, treat the gut. Why do we say that? Mrs. Patient, if you back your car up into a snow bank and the exhaust pipe gets full of snow, the exhaust comes back into the engine. We have to have a well-functioning gut to get rid of our toxins. When we don't have a well-functioning gut, I mean, it should be that the goal, one of the goals for you and your patients is you really look forward to telling your spouse or partner, I just had the best bowel movement. I feel so great because it's critical for us and it's such a simple thing that we don't pay any attention to. One of the first recommendations to patients a half ounce of water per pound body weight. Why? You have to hydrate enough to move things along, right? But I'll be peeing all day. That's the idea. You want to keep flushing out what's been coming in that we don't need anymore. So this is the first talk where we're going to dig into some of the science. We're going to do a little bit of a deep dive here. And why are we focusing on the gut? The gut is the organ of the body that produces a majority of the neurotransmitters. It houses two-thirds of the immune system. Why does it house two-thirds of the immune system? Mrs. Patient, our bodies are exactly the same as our ancestors thousands of years ago. We have the same kidneys. They function the same way. We have the same gallbladder. It functions the same way. We have the same immune system. It functions the same way. What did our immune systems have to protect us from? Bugs, parasites, viruses, molds, fungus, and bacteria. What else did our immune systems have to protect us from our, for our ancestors? Nothing. There was not bisphenol A, red dye number 62, perchloral ethylene, benzene. Every time you pump gas, do you smell a little gas? You're smelling benzene. If you smell it, it's going right in and it causes a breach of the blood-brain barrier. That's called leaky brain. But we get these minor toxins accumulating in us all day long, another reason why we want to hydrate well enough. But why is two-thirds of the immune system in the gut? Because that's where our ancestors were threatened more than anywhere else, was by what they were eating and drinking. That's why it's there. The gut houses a genome 100 to 150 times larger than the human genome. And we all know that genes determine function. We call it the metabolome. And it's not just the human genes that determine our metabolome. You'll learn that the bacterial genes, the genes of the microbiota, have a huge impact on the metabolome, what's happening in our bodies. The gut has a metabolic activity greater than the liver. So the most effective clinical outcomes across all disease spectrums can result from normalization of gut function. Ask any functional medicine practitioner in clinical practice, what do you find works more often than anything else to get the patient on the road to recovery? Treat the gut. More often than anything else. That's why we start with the gut. So there are three performance objectives of this talk, and the first one is identify the key functional roles of the GI tract and recognize how impairments may lead to dysfunction. What are impairments of the GI tract? Well, nutrient insufficiencies, medications, dysbiosis, parasites, food reactions, and surgery disturb the microbiota, causing a localized irritation and inflammation, local reactions, localized symptoms, disruption of the mucosal barrier, macromolecules going through an increased mucosal permeability, LPS, bacteria, yeast, protozoa, toxin, uh, translocation into portal and systemic circulation, creating immune um, inflammatory response, 
and immune-mediated reactions and distant signs and symptoms we call the autoimmune spectrum. Not autoimmune disease, autoimmune spectrum. What's the autoimmune spectrum? Nobody gets rheumatoid arthritis when they're diagnosed. And what you learn is that it's been developing for years before there were ever any symptoms. Parkinson's develops for years before there were any symptoms. Alzheimer's develops for years before there are any symptoms. It's called preclinical Alzheimer's. Watch this. How many know or suspect that you may have a sensitivity to wheat? Show of hands, please. Hold, hold them high for a minute. Look around the room. Look around the room. This is not a talk to a celiac group where everyone has a sensitivity to wheat. This is a talk to healthcare practitioners who know a little more in general. Now watch this. How many of you know or suspect if you have an inadvertent exposure to wheat, it seems to affect your brain? Hands up high again, please. Look around the room. Alzheimer's is years before there are symptoms. Years. The Alzheimer's Association came out this year and said one in three elders will die with Alzheimer's or dementia, another form of dementia. One in three in the U.S. That means those two rows over will die with dementia. So I'm going to stand on this side of the stage for the rest of the talk, right? But that's our current statistics, that these things are going on for years before anyone has symptoms. Does that make sense to you? So you're here learning functional medicine principles to identify this stuff and nip it in the bud years before there's so much tissue destruction, it's obvious with symptoms. Does that make sense to you? That's what this is all about, is going back upstream. So, the key functional roles and aspects of the gut, this morning you learned the mnemonic, go to it, now you're going to learn dig in. Dig in is for the gut. That stands for digestion absorption, intestinal permeability, gut microbiota, immune modulation, and the enteric nervous system. Dig in. That's what we'll talk about in this next 90 minutes. So the first one, digestion and absorption. Mrs. Patient. Now, I'm going to give you lots of analogies for patients. You, you guys are welcome to use these or make up your own, but it really helps patients when you want to encourage compliance in changing lifestyle if they have a little bit of a bigger understanding of why we're doing this, right? Mrs. Patient, your digestive tract starts in the mouth, it goes to the other end. It's about 20, 25 feet long, winds around in the middle there. If you think of it like a donut, if you could stretch the donut out, that's your digestive tract. When you swallow food and you look down the donut, it's in the tube. It's not in the body yet. It's still in the tube. It's got to be digested and broken down into really small particles that go right through the wall of the donut into the bloodstream. Patients understand that concept. So when you want to talk to them about digestion and how you want to enhance the effectiveness of their digestion, give them visuals that they understand. And they'll, they'll be with you and they'll give it a shot. They'll take the hydrochloric acid or they'll do whatever your recommendations are to enhance digestion if they've got that visual. You've got to get the, the food to go through the walls of the donut. The area of contact with the outside world of the GI tract is somewhere around the size of a half of a badminton court, about 30 to 40 square meters. That's a lot of space. How is that possible? If you have a ocean front or lake front and you're walking the beach, if it's a half a mile that you're a uh, beach that you're of uh, uh, that you're walking, you're walking a half a mile. But if along that half a mile there's inlets and there's small bays, you're walking a lot more than a half a mile. There's a lot more surface area where the land meets the water. That's why we have villi and microvilli is to have more surface area where our immune system can check out everything we're eating to make sure that it's safe and to break it down and allow enough time for it to be absorbed into the submucosa and into the bloodstream. Mrs. Patient, the inside of that donut in your intestines is like shag carpeting. And this shag is where B vitamins are absorbed, this shag proteins, these shags over here fats, these shags over here carbohydrates, all the shags absorb different nutrients. 
Celiac disease is when the shags wear down and you've got Berber. You don't absorb calcium. You get osteoporosis. That's why in the annals of internal medicine, they say every osteoporotic patient needs to be checked for celiac disease because it's such a common cause of osteoporosis. Every one of them. That's why is because if you've got this or any level of wearing down of the shags, you can't absorb your nutrients. You can take the best supplements, the best foods, but you won't absorb them. So the digestive tract starts in the oral mucosa in the mouth, and it starts with chewing. Most of us will chew a fork full of food three to five times. Three to five chews, and then we swallow. I call that shoveling. And I shovel way too often. It's a really good exercise to try it one time. Just try it one time. It's a macrobiotic concept. Chew one forkful of food 30 times. Chew some rice or some pasta or some bread 30 times. Notice what you taste towards the end of the 30 times. The food tastes really sweet because the tylen and the alpha amylase that you're producing in the saliva is breaking down the starches and you're tasting the sugars. That's the purpose of producing saliva is to start to break down the starches and act as a catalyst as you swallow to activate the parietal cells to make hydrochloric acid. I call it the 40-40. By the age of 40, about 40% 40 of my patients will have hydrochloric acid deficiencies. They're just not making as, as much as they used to. Many reasons for that, but when you recognize that, you may want to address inadequate hydrochloric acid secretion. And how do you identify this? In your toolkit, we've got handouts for you on some of the common symptoms of hydrochloric acid insufficiencies and some of the common symptoms of pancreatic enzyme insufficiencies so that you can identify, oh, they've got this, this oh, that, that might be hydrochloric acid. Maybe we'll try a little bit of this and see what the results are. And then a week later, the patient comes back or they call in and say, I'm having the best bowel movements I've had in years. I feel really good. After chewing and swallowing production of hydrochloric acid, now we go down into the small intestine where uh, the uh, enzymes of the microbiota start to do their work. The epithelial lining of the small intestine produces cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin, depending on how much fat's in a meal, sends a message up to the gallbladder, hey, we've got this amount of fat, we need this amount of bile. The gallbladder squeezes that amount of bile down into the small intestine to help digest the fats. Cholecystokinin also sends a message to the pancreas. We've got this amount of protein. I need about this amount of pancreatic enzymes to break down the proteins. Cholecystokinin is critically important. It's greatly reduced when you have inflammation in the small intestine. So your gallbladder doesn't get the message of how much fat's coming in. Your pancreas won't get the message of how much fat's coming in. So you have digestive imbalances that may occur, and the gallbladder may be fully functional, but it's just not being directed properly. We know in celiac disease, in celiac, the celiacs produce one-third the cholecystokinin that they should. So if you produce one-third the cholecystokinin of the amount of fats that are coming in, the gallbladder gets the, the direction to secrete one-third the amount that it should of bile, so you get increased gallbladder volume, reduced gallbladder emptying. It's a great article in uh, Hepatology, November of 2007, The Liver and Celiac Disease by uh, Mayo Clinic, by um, Murray at Mayo Clinic. And it's a great article, and you see all of the complications that can occur. But one-third production of cholecystokinin, reduced gallbladder emptying, increased gallbladder volume. What do you get? Stones because the bile dries up in there. It starts to give you an understanding of going back upstream where stones may come from if there's inflammation in the gut. So from, this, from the mouth all the way to the other end, the digestive tract is critically important. All of the secretions are critically important to break down this food. 
Mrs. Patient, think of your food like a raspberry. It's got a lot of little parts to it. They all look the same. Digestion is the process of breaking down each piece of that raspberry so it's small enough to go right through the walls of the intestine into the bloodstream. It slips right through. Now that tube from the mouth to the other end that winds around in there, it's lined with cheesecloth. When you get the molecules of food broken down small enough, they go right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. And your body uses them to make new cells, bone cells, brain cells, skin cells. But when you get tears in the cheesecloth, that's called intestinal permeability. That's a big geeky word, but really it's leaky gut. You know, you don't use just big words with them. You know, of course, say, you know, that's leaky gut. But it's a good scrabble word. You can say permeability, intestinal permeability. Then they smile a little bit, right? They're, they're with you. So digestion absorption of the carbohydrates, you've got fiber, soluble and insoluble fiber that feeds the probiotic bacteria. We'll talk a lot more about that in a couple of minutes. The starches breaking down into simple sugars, the proteins that are broken down into peptides and eventually into amino acids, and the fats that are broken down into short-chain and long-chain fatty acids. There's mechanical breakdown, there's enzyme hydrolysis of carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, active and passive absorption, and regulation from CNS and central nervous system and the enteric nervous system, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail. But I can't emphasize enough how important digestive enzyme function is to whatever condition your patient is presenting with. Because if they have nutrient insufficiencies and nutrient deficiencies, because they can't break down the food properly to be absorbed properly into the system, it doesn't matter what supplements you're giving them or what foods you're giving them. If they can't get the nutrients out of it or they're limited to just a small percentage of the nutrients in their food, they're going to develop enzyme and mineral, enzyme, vitamin, mineral deficiencies. So impairments in digestion and absorption can occur because of inadequate mastication. Almost all of us don't chew enough. It really can make a big difference. It can make a huge difference in their function when you have adequate mastication. Hypochlorhydria, pancreatic bile insufficiencies, brush border injuries, we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. What about intestinal permeability? Well, the first I in dig in is for intestinal permeability. And we know that there are a number of imaginary boundaries in the animal kingdom. Also in our guts, there's this boundary. This is a uh, 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 article that came out 30 years ago telling us about the importance of the epithelial boundary in the gut. Luminal complexing by secretory IgA, remember IgA is secreted, binds onto toxins in the gut and holds on to them to be escorted out. Luminal complexing by secretory IgA and an intact epithelial barrier limit uptake of luminal antigen. However, intestinal inflammation enhances mucosal uptake and systemic distribution of potentially injurious macromolecules. I'll show you a video of that in just a minute. This paper that came out about 10 years ago was the Amgen Award Lecture by a professor from the University of Chicago, whose name I don't remember right now. I can't see his name on there. This is, uh, but this is one of those papers, sometimes I get a paper and it just catches me. I tape it on the ceiling of my bedroom. And when I go to sleep at night, I just look up at it, so, wow, wow. And then I go to sleep and I used to think I'd remember, I don't remember anymore, so I have this little thing on the nightstand next to my bed where it's a, um, if I pull the pen out, there's a very soft little light that shines down on the paper, not so bright to blind you. And I just write down what my thought is. And I wake up in the morning and say, oh, yeah, that's right. This was one of those papers. A critical function of epithelial line surfaces is to define the interface between separate body compartments. Well, we know that. Examples include the skin which maintains a barrier that supports overall homeostasis and prevents systemic infection. And the renal tubule, 
which forms a barrier that maintains gradients between the renal interstitium and the sterile tubular lumen to allow active and passive transport to regulate urine composition. But the intestinal mucosa has a far more difficult charge. It must balance the needs for a barrier against a hostile environment, like the skin, with the necessity of active and passive transport, like the renal tubule. An intact intestinal barrier is therefore critical to normal physiological function and prevention of disease. So if you have an aspect of body function that's critical to normal physiological function and prevention of disease, should we have some attention on it? And the answer is yes, we should. So the pathophysiology of a number of diseases associated with a dysfunctional intestinal barrier. This paper came out a couple of years ago. And there's been 25 years of papers now coming out on this topic of intestinal permeability. The small intestine, there's the tube, there's the villi, there's the microvilli um, around the villi with the composition of the lacteals and the capillaries in there. So an epithelial cell is a single layer thick. It's hard for me to imagine that. I have a hard time, and how many functions it has is just difficult for me. I love this drawing. This is from the Annals of the New York Academy of Science. And here is the artist's drawing of two cells in box A. Box B is a photo of a tight junction. That's the space between the two cells. And then where they circled it and they magnified it, what you see here is the loops of the tight junction. They're all in loops. And the loops where the cells of each lateral wall touch each other is called the kissing joint. And the kissing joint opens and closes by the tight junction strand, the function of the tight junction strand. Now that's all geeky stuff, but here's where it gets cool. When the artist drew the tight junction strand and the kissing joint on the right side here, this is the space between the cells, this is the tight junction space, and these are the proteins that control the shoelaces of the tight junction. And just like a high school kid that doesn't tie his shoes, running down the street, the shoes flop on his feet, when you have dysfunction of these uh, proteins, the zonulin family of proteins, you get gaps here. Now, I like to think of the photo. I had this on my wall, on the ceiling, in my room. And one day I just woke up and I, oh, it's the Panama Canal. Gates open. Little food molecules go in, the gate closes, the immune system checks it out. Next gate's open, the immune, uh, mole food molecule goes a little bit further, gate closed, immune system checks it out. Next gate's open, checks it out. Isn't it cool to see the pictures? It gives you an understanding of how our immune system screens, why 70% of the immune system's in the gut. This is just one of the protective mechanisms to help protect us from any tox potentially toxic molecules getting into the submucosa. Now here's a kicker. Some of you have heard that vitamin D, adequate levels of vitamin D seem to have something to do with reducing your risk of developing autoimmune diseases. It's very true, there's lots of studies on that. There's a 2008 study that came out from the University of Chicago that tells us vitamin D modulates the kissing joints. It completely controls the opening and closing of the gates of the Panama Canal. That's one of the functions of what vitamin D does, the opening and closing of the gates. So here's a photo, once again, of the tight junction. There are the microvilli. Here are the tight junctions. And here is the actomyosin network. You can see it's almost like roots of the microvilli coming down into this whole network here of proteins. That actomyosin network here is where the villi anchor into. And this is an artist's drawing of that. You can see the actomyosin network here. You can see it here. Now, why are we emphasizing the actomyosin network? Because it's one of the biomarkers, antibodies to the actomyosin network is a biomarker suggesting 
intestinal permeability. If you have elevated antibodies to the actomyosin network. Another biomarker of intestinal permeability is elevated antibodies to the zonulin family of proteins. And elevated antibodies to the zonulin family of proteins is suggestive of uh, intestinal permeability, paracellular, in between the cells, paracellular permeability. Elevated antibodies to actomyosin network is suggestive of transcellular intestinal permeability right through the cell. And you can do these tests. They're simple tests. They're simple blood tests now. So you think about the tight junctions and all of the molecules. Here's how to think about it. Just do a mental note for a minute. How many different foods did I eat last night? Let's see. I had tofu. I had quinoa, pickled onions, shredded carrots, uh, cilantro, and some dill sauce or something on it. That was my dinner last night. How many different types of molecules are trying to get through the tight junction into the submucosa in my gut today? Right? There's backup. I mean, there's so many different molecules that we have to screen for that our gut is constantly trying to regulate to make sure toxins don't get in to our system. Why is this so important? The mucosa is directly exposed to the external environment and taxed with antigenic loads consisting of commensal bacteria, dietary antigens, and viruses at far greater quantities every day than your systemic immune system sees in a lifetime. That's a ceiling post right there. It's like, what? How many of us put emphasis on the immune system of our guts? When someone comes in with some type of immune dysfunction, what do we do? We do a blood test, looking for whatever we're going to look for. How many of us also do a stool analysis, looking for biomarkers of the immune system in the gut? But the gut is doing far more every single day than the blood is going to do in a lifetime. I think we've had our priorities altered, right? So when you start including more emphasis on the gut and the immune system of the gut, you get such great results. Remember, I started off with death begins in the colon. We don't put enough attention on the gut. Hopefully now we will. <laughs>